Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. This week, we're going back to review a book by an author we reviewed last year. Um, last year, while we were reviewing all of the nominees for Best Horror Novel, uh, as uh, selected by the Bram Stoker Awards Committee, we reviewed The Hunger by Al Makatsu. Tonight, The Deep by Al Makatsu. And not only that... But once you're done listening to this, you can go ahead and just move right forward to the next episode and hear our interview with Alma. All right. Here's a little bit about uh, Alma Katsu. This is her bio that I pulled off of Amazon. And this is really weird. So her Amazon, and it bears bringing up, her Amazon bio starts with a bunch of um, almost like blurbs about either her books or herself. Mostly like blurbs about her books, you know, from like New York Times or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom, there's like a little biographical part that kind of follows the momentum of that. So this is different. It reads a little different than a normal bio. It's just because it was kind of pieced together with a bunch of other uh, blurbs of her books and stuff. Uh, Ms. Katsu's debut novel, The Taker, was selected by Booklist as one of the top 10 debut novels of 2011. She's a graduate of the John Hopkins Writing Program and Brandeis University, where she studied with novelist John Irving and an alumni of the Squaw Valley Writers Conference. Like many writers, she has a day job, too. For over 30 years, she was an intelligence analyst for the federal government and RAND and is currently a consultant on emerging technology. That's quite the resume. Intelligence analyst. So she just, like... You say something and she's like, yeah, that was pretty smart. That or she's actually able to listen to us doing this before it posts. Oh, like you think she's Mm -hmm. listening now, like live? Yeah, just be careful what you say, buddy. I mean, she's great. (laughs) All right, here is the synopsis. Um, Buckle in, kids. This is maybe the longest synopsis that we've done, right? I mean, I know we don't track this, but this has got to be close, right? It's hefty. All right, here we go. From the acclaimed and award-winning author of The Hunger comes an eerie psychological twist on one of the world's most renowned tragedies, the sinking of the Titanic and the ill-fated sail of its sister ship, the Britannic. Someone or something is haunting the ship. Between mysterious disappearances and sudden deaths, the guests of the Titanic have found themselves suspended in an eerie, unsettling twilight zone from the moment they set sail. Several of them, including maid Annie Hebley, guests Mark Fletcher and millionaires Madeline Astor and Benjamin Guggenheim are convinced there's something sinister, almost otherworldly, afoot. But before they can locate the source of the danger, as the world knows, disaster strikes. Years later, Annie, having survived that fateful night, has attempted to put her life back together, working as a nurse on the sixth voyage of the Titanic's sister ship, the Britannic, newly refitted as a hospital ship. She happens across an unconscious Mark, now a soldier fighting in World War I. At first, Annie is thrilled and relieved to learn that he too survived the sinking, but soon Mark's presence awakens deep buried feelings and secrets, forcing her to reckon with the demons of her past as they both discover that the terror may not yet be over. Brilliantly combining the supernatural with the height of historical disaster, the deep is an exploration of love and destiny, desire and innocence, and above all, a quest to understand how our choices can lead us inexorably toward our doom. If this is not the longest synopsis <laughs> we have, I will guarantee this is the most commas in a synopsis yeah. that I've ever read. A yeah. lot of commas. They don't a lot like to commas. break up into sentences. <laughs> Although, like, um, I, I don't have many critiques about the content of no. the synopsis. It's actually a really good kind of summary of what the book is and what the the tone or feel of the, of the book is as well. Yeah. I, I was thinking the same thing. Like this is uh, other than the length is definitely a really, really good synopsis. I saw someone that um, I'm friends with on, on Facebook that I don't know personally was talking about sitting down to write their synopsis and that the urge to start typing out like actual tips was so strong, dude. And I was like, I don't even know this person. Like if it was, if it was right. somebody else, <laughs> if this was, you know, one, one of our close friends, I'd have been like, all right, I'm going to private message you. Let me give you some fucking ideas about the synopsis. <laughs> so maybe we should do a special episode where we talk about is like our tips to authors about stuff that we've observed over the years. Yeah. The fucked up part about that though, is that we're, I mean, who the hell are we readers? We're the ones that they want to get the book. No, that's true. But then we always talk about not reading the synopsis until after we've read the book. Fuck. 
We're, <laughs> <laughs> we're also like, um, yeah, bad readers. I don't know. Actually, we're really good. I don't know what it is, but anyway. So this book starts off, um, where the the main character is Annie, who is mentioned in the synopsis, Annie Hebley, and she is a stewardess on the Titanic, as it mentioned. And also like she's, she's working on the Britannic years later. So, uh, she's the person that we follow almost, well, definitely the most, but almost entirely throughout the book. Um, and the very start of the book is, uh, basically at the time of the sinking of the Titanic, where she is going under and basically drowning, like kind of at that point where you, stop struggling and just kind of give in and um but she's somehow kind of comforted by like a voice or a presence in the water saying like it's all good basically as as like kind of she fades to black so that's it starts out very dramatically with a woman giving over to drowning in the middle of this kind of disaster yes and we see that's a very brief introduction and then we're moved forward. So the, the, the book takes place in 1912 and 1916. So 1912 is the Titanic. Uh, 1916 is the Britannic. Did you know the Britannic was a thing? Yes. I did not know that. We'll talk um, more about those for sure. Yeah. So we fast forward from that scene to 1916, and, and we're introduced to the situation through a, a couple of letters. One is uh, Annie's father who has been scouring um, you know, various towns, countries, whatever, looking for Annie um, in hospitals, um, asylums, and, and whatnot. And, and through these letters and then an introduction to Annie, we find out that she has indeed been in this asylum for for four years, since right after the sinking of the, of the Titanic. And uh, essentially, she is now well enough to um, you know, go back out into the world and the way she chooses to do this is to i mean really questioning like to return to a ship that looks just like the titanic so she's been in contact with with a, a friend and fellow um maid i guess would be a good way to to, to put it the, on the on the titanic um who also survived and, and that that lady's name is violet and she is now a nurse on the britannic which is uh the the twin to the titanic but that's a hospital ship so she's telling Annie, no, no, it'll, you'll be fine when you get here. There's lots of work. It's easy to get a job. I'll totally hook you up. And that kind of takes us into the story. Little note about the the structure of, of the book. Um, it does do kind of an alt. Uh, it alters between the story that took place during the Titanic uh, trip and the story that takes place years later on the Britannic and to uh, Ms. Katsu's credit, she does it very nicely where basically there's sections of the book and one section is entirely in 1912 and then the next section is entirely in 1916. And while like, you know, in each one, like there might be a little bit of reference to something else, um, it sticks very well to uh, keeping everything that's going on uh, of that time. But like obviously in the 1916 ones, people might refer back to 1912. So the structure is nice and easy to, to follow. You know what year you're in. You you know, even though the perspective does shift um, between characters, um, I think she does a really good job of keeping you aware of of who we're following, what year it is, and you know what ship we're on and what's going on. Yeah, and the other nice touch um, added into that are. Uh, uh, interspersed throughout are, as I mentioned, letters. So it starts off with with a couple of letters. Um, there's some journal entries. So there's some other things that serve to m make it feel a little more historical. You know, like right. that that type of thing. Even though I, I'm not, I, I'm not certain. I mean, obviously a Annie is a fictional character. Um, I don't believe she was a real person. So obviously letters from her father are not, you know, but I don't know if some of these other letters could be things that were actually found. You know what I mean? Like that, that were put into the book that are actual history. But even if they're not, I feel like it, it adds that little bit of grounding to the, the time frame that they take place in, which I thought was pretty cool. And interestingly, um, I guess maybe not interestingly, but um, just a point of fact, 
uh, as the 1916 timeline is is explored, which I think that's the first one we go through kind of in detail, um, there's references back to stuff that happened earlier to uh, Annie and then maybe like other pivotal characters, but we don't know what happened. So there's a lot of um, kind of mystery that's kind of stirred up at the beginning of they're referring to something that I'm not aware of yet. And so the book definitely um, pays off those references as time goes on. But at the beginning, you're definitely kind of in the dark about some of the stuff. And uh, to a degree, so is Annie. Or at least it seems that way. Like she's not fully um, uh, aware of everything that happened in her past between like when the Titanic stuff happened and then, uh, you know, in her years at the like mental facility or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's done very well. Um, how do I say this? There's a couple of things I really like. So I want to address this one now. I, I really like that, that sense of mystery and the story more slowly unfolding. So when you think when you meet somebody, they don't typically give you their whole backstory, right? Like you meet them under whatever circumstances and there's some small talk and you start to get to know them and you, you maybe get to know them a little backwards. Like you don't find out important yeah. details about their life right away. And I felt like that was handled really well in this book. Somebody else could have given you a whole lot of backstory all at one time. And I feel like there are some writers that do that. I feel there are some writers that try to do this and don't pull it off very well, but but Al Makatsu did, did a really good job. It was one of the things I like most about this book is the really slow unfolding of the backstory. Definitely. Yeah. Cause there was stuff that like even 80, maybe even 90% of the book, I was like, all right, so that's what that is. <laughs> um, yep. So on the Titanic, basically um, it kicks off right with like the, the opening day, the first day where, um, you know, the, the crew is already on board the ship and they're kind of being coached about this is what you're going to do. And Annie, who is our protagonist, is assigned to um, 12 of the suites in, like, the first class section. And it basically sounds like anything they want at any time of day, if they call, you answer. And so it sounds like a really grueling kind of, uh, like, a grind of a job. But, I mean, I imagine that, like, it's probably better than, you know, helping out the people in the second or the third class sections people, the people in those classes don't get any help that's yeah that's or, or yeah maybe they don't have help <laughs> um but one of the things that happens early on is as passengers are boarding and they're about to start meeting some of the people that they're in charge of uh taking care of for the journey um uh annie sees a, a man holding a baby and uh it looks like he's kind of struggling to to keep the baby you know quiet and and, and you know in control as they're getting on the ship. And so her instinct is to go, uh, try and help out. And she discovers that he's not one of the people that's part of her section of people that she's supporting, but he is staying nearby. And then her, his wife shows up and then she shows them to their place. But there's almost like an instant, if it's not recognition, familiarity, uh, between her and the, the, the man. And that sets off, one of the main characters in the book, it introduces uh, Mark Fletcher, I believe his name is. That's um, correct. Yeah, who's one of the bigger characters that, that we see throughout the, the story. Yep. So Mark and Caroline um, have this baby. Um, Caroline is wealthy. Um, Mark married up in the world. So he comes from uh, more meager beginnings, uh, more like Annie than, than like his wife. Um, but this is first class, so there are a ton of wealthy characters um, that are introduced through the course of, of this story. And, and I mean, we'll, we'll pause, I guess, a, a little bit to, to talk about characters. Um, some of these people are real people. Um, some of them are fictional people. I'll be honest, I didn't do a lot of research into into which ones are real and which ones are fictional. But, you know, uh, Guggenheim, I can guess that that's probably um, a real person, right? Benjamin Guggenheim. Yes. Yeah. He's a, who's a, I don't know, fashion designer, maybe in the book. I don't mm -hmm. know, but there are, yeah, there's, there's a, a woman who's a fashion designer. I'm sure is a real person, but there are all these different people. And, and one of the things I wanted to say, although the cast is big, the other thing I really liked, and, and I, I didn't realize this till probably about two thirds in the way in the book is 
the way she captured these characters, you can tell that almost every one of these characters in this book thinks that they're the main character of this story. That's so, a really good point. <laughs> yeah, and it's but it's so it's very true in life, but when we're when we're exposed to a film or a book or or a TV show, we very often are given this is your main character, follow this person. Everybody else is only there to serve <laughs> at the pleasure of this person's story. And you know, it, it says that obviously there are some perhaps supernatural things afoot, but it struck me that a lot of the passengers feel that the supernatural things are directly related to them. Yeah. And credit to her. I mean, the book is what 400 pages, just a little bit North of Mm -hmm. that Um, credit to the author. She didn't go nuts on building up these crazy stories. Like there wasn't a Benjamin Guggenheim chapter, but um, she managed to, in the short amount of time that we saw some of these characters um, kind of bake in, uh, enough of a story that like whatever was going on in the overall story had an impact on them that was believable and interesting without being like, Oh man, here's another chapter about this person who I know isn't the main character that I don't really care too much about. Like she did a really good job of balancing um, mm-hmm. kind of characterization without sacrificing the story in a way that's actually pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, two other characters I want to talk about and zero in on a little more specifically because they have their own stories. But outside of Annie, they're really the only people with like a legit story in this book that are not wealthy. And that's two young boxers, um, Die, which is apparently short for David, I'm guessing, or Irish for David or <laughs> something. I don't know. And Les. Um, they are... Uh, although not overtly, um, they are, uh, gay. They're, they're a couple, um, taking place in, in 1912, um, which I'm sure is not unheard of, but, uh, is an interesting look at a gay couple and how they have to behave, um, a hundred and almost 10 years ago. Um, they are boxers who are going to America to get a new start, but, but they're also con artists, and Les is definitely the mastermind behind that, while Dai is more in love with him um, in spite of his flaws and wrongdoing. Um, and I thought that there was a very interesting story for the two of them, which was, although they interact with other characters, I felt like it was a completely separate story that just happened to take place in the same place where I felt like all the other stories were more intertwined. Did you going to? Yes. So if, if if we had to like do a hierarchy, obviously Annie, Mark are kind of the main level of character. These guys are secondary. Everything else is tertiary, but again, like um, not really like noticeably. So like they, they all blend together pretty well. You just get like a stronger vein of, of the story of die and less than you do from the other characters. And I agree. Like if she was like, I'm doing a spinoff story. That's a novella about these two. I would read the shit out of that because it was a, a really interesting dynamic and, and definitely, like you said, um, obviously gay wasn't like invented in the sixties when Stonewall happened. Um, so seeing people, um, in a, in a historic setting who had to kind of hide who they were was an interesting part of it too. We'll go a little further into the story. I'm going to leave 1916 out, um, of the story discussion. All right. We'll, we'll leave it to sit. Annie is on a boat that is the sister ship to the boat that sunk. <laughs> like, I think that, and then that kind of can unfold <laughs> on its own. Um, but essentially what happens is that Annie is very drawn to Mark and, and to um, Mark and Caroline's baby. Um, I don't want to say unnaturally so, but unreasonably so for someone that she just met. Um, Caroline is uh, is having some um, issues with motherhood and, and dealing with, with that and um, the medicine prescribed for her, which I think is interesting and, and worth talking about, right, is cocaine uh, that's yeah. prescribed to her by a doctor. <laughs> it's so, obvious that the doctors back then had no idea how to use cocaine, too, by the way. Yep. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, then nobody's <laughs> snorting. What the hell? So um, the... Uh, so that's one of the storylines that, that, that develops. And then uh, amongst that, we have other people 
people on the ship. And the one common thread through the the wealthy people, at least, is that all of them feel something unnatural is going on. And it kind of starts um, with a little kid. I don't know that we ever got his age. I got the impression he was like seven or so. Yeah, seven. I think seven. Yep. Yeah. He, at one point, claims to have heard a voice calling to him from the sea, and he is saved by Dai, who is the boxer, um, as he's starting to climb like on the rail and, and could potentially fall all overboard. Um, and that child, very soon after, um, dies a mysterious death, which really adds to this element of something is going on. And that's where I found, like I said, the character is so interesting because... A lot of them buy into it, and a lot of them feel like they're the main character in the story, and that's really where this got got really good for me. Yeah, the boy's death, if I remember correctly, they just said like his heart just stopped or something like that. But again, these are the doctors that are like, you should have cocaine. Uh, so, yep. in which I trust them. <laughs> well, to be fair, it was like it was like this laudanum stuff is dangerous. Let's give him cocaine. <laughs> yeah. So you can arguably, have that opium. Here's cocaine. Yeah. Yeah, arguably, if you had to take one, I think the cocaine might actually be better for you. I, well, I, I <laughs> this is no, where I'm going to plead some, ignorance. I've some, never there's some there's some googling happening. Hold on, cocaine versus laud <laughs> is it laudanum? Laudanum, is that... which isn't that just it's opium? Like they were taking opium um, versus yeah. cocaine, which I mean that's just spectrums of different. Like opium uh, dulls you, right? Whereas cocaine is a stimulant. Yep. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not finding a good comparison chart. I'll have to do some research on my own. <laughs> you need to get a hold of a, a 1912 doctor and be like, hey, tell yeah. me why you were making these choices you were making. <laughs> Listen, I know you're 130 years old, but do you have a prescription pad laying around? I don't think your doctor's <laughs> license expires. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Once you get it, it's good forever. Pretty much. Um, like a... All right, so here's my. I'm going to pause a little bit because um, there was that, like Livia said, uh, the the boy Tommy, I believe his name was, who um, died tragically at, toward the beginning of the story, and basically put on everybody's radar. There is some creepy shit happening on this on this ship, um, like hauntings and ghosts or whatever. The, the, you know, like the the rumors are that are going around. Um, there was like a call from the sea kind of thing, which. I I haven't spent a lot of time at sea. Um, if I had to quantify it, it's probably like zero uh, hours at sea. Um, I mean, I've been to the ocean and stuff like that, but I've never been on a big old boat. Like, have you ever? What I guess what I'm getting at is like, have like how much do you know of or or know about like the idea of like sirens or like the lure of the sea and stuff like that. Um, but I think you asked two questions that might be a little unrelated. I'm, I'm a little <laughs> familiar with like the, the, the mythology of like sirens. Um, you don't actually have to go on a boat to hear about that. Um, so I've never been on a boat on the ocean. I've been on smaller lake boats and river boats and stuff, but no, I've never been on the ocean on a boat. I want to, now I kind of want Al Makatsu to do like the deep cruise where you go, <laughs> you go like yeah. a. I would totally do that. I'd pay like how much how much can a cruise cost? 60, 70 bucks or something like that. Look, I don't want to I don't want to um impede um Al Makatsu's plans to do a the deep cruise or whatever. <laughs> Dude, fuck cruise ships, man. I don't know if you've been paying attention to cruise ship news over the last like 4 or 5 years. Nothing good can come from going on a cruise anymore. Like they get stranded. Um they have sewage problems and then you're spending 3 days on a ship where you can smell sewage. Um, we just had all those people were quarantined on a ship for like two weeks because of the coronavirus. Like, like, sh don't do that. Fly I mean, somewhere. Obviously, it's because of all the spirits of the sea is why all this stuff is happening. Right? That that could be all I can say is I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I was never thrilled about the idea of a cruise because that just felt like way too much time spent getting somewhere. Um, but after the last few years, I've been totally nixing of the of the booked cruise or the Almakatsu cruise or. <laughs> Whatever Motley Crew I think does like a weird cruise or something. Like Motley Cruise. Motley Cruise. The Motley nice. Cruise. Um, well, there goes my idea for cruised, which could either be our booked cruise or like you know it could go back to like those those boxing boys. Mm -hmm. All right, back to the story. I think I, I was right. just I, I I the idea 
that I'm not, I guess what I was trying to uh, convey was that I'm not super familiar with this, like the, like being drawn to your ultimate demise in the sea thing. So, um, like I get it and it's like, it's occurred in stories that I've read or, or or movies I've watched and stuff like that, but it just doesn't have like, like a resonance to it as much as I'd like it to. Um, I know that, um, since typically lure sailors like specifically sailors and and i think it's actually mentioned in the book um so i i'm familiar with it it's uh it would probably be a tough one to write a good story around that being said that element in its use in, in the titanic makes perfect sense and is done is done very well so agreed mm -hmm. um Following the loss of, of the little boy, uh, I would say that um, so that we don't tell you beat by beat what this story is and you can actually read some of it for yourself. Kind of the main theme is um, uh, a few things like we're watching uh, Annie and her interaction with like the Fletchers and the baby whose name is Andine. Um, we're watching the how how these rich people are getting on on the Titanic. But also there's there's this um, creeping feeling that everybody starts to get more and more of about a haunting on the ship and like, you know, um, things not necessarily super, uh, yeah, a supernatural, I guess, influence on um, what's happening on the ship. And it turns into not just like something, there's something, there's a spirit on board or whatever, but people start to look at each other a little bit like this person's acting strange. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think all of that is really kind of punctuated and done really well for us based on the fact that, you know, you probably know. I mean, Rob sent me a spoiler telling me when he was down with the book that the Titanic sinks. Um, but, you know, it's coming. Right. <laughs> so there's already kind of a sense of dread. Like when you're when you're reading a book and you know the end is near. Now I don't know specifically. Like I I I saw the movie like everyone else twenty years ago, right? I don't know how many days they were out there or stuff. So as this is happening, you know what I'm like? Well, they're gonna hit an iceberg, and a lot of people are gonna die. So you know that. So I felt like the the dread that they're feeling because of potentially supernatural stuff. I was feeling a similar dread in knowing these people are all doomed. Yeah. So it, play, it plays really well that way. I think it puts you in the right frame of mind. Um, if this was a book about an unnamed ship that sinks, I don't think that you'd get the same feeling. I agree. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much more we can talk about story. Um, Livius gave you the big spoiler already mm -hmm. that the Titanic goes down. Um, but, like, yeah, the whole, like... <sighs> Yeah, what do we? What else do we say? I can't even. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the the other thing that that I'll say is, um, I guess I could pull this up on Amazon. Um, it's to me, this was gothic horror, and I don't know if if Miss Katsu would would say thing. Um, gothic horror is a genre I really like when it's done well. Um, and I really felt that this kind of kind of checked some boxes to get there. So obviously it's a period piece. Obviously there are some supernatural things going on, but it's not it's not like really overt. So, I, you know, I wouldn't just want to call this horror. I'd want to um, narrow it down a little bit for people. Um, yeah. in Amazon, it's in. It's ranking in psychological fiction, historical thrillers, and ghost thrillers. Um, but I would definitely say if you were a fan of gothic horror, this is this is a sure. good one for you to read. Yeah, I, I'll agree with that. And honestly, like um, there are plenty of strengths. I'd say for the the, the story itself, I think that um, when you choose to do a historical fiction piece. Um, you kind of got to nail the history, right? Like, even if like it's embellished and stuff, you have to make it um, accurate enough while also being interesting, but also contributing to the story. And um, otherwise, why even bother? Like, if you just want to put it on the Titanic so more people read it, you're doing a disservice to your story. 
Almakatsu in integrates the story of of the Titanic so well into the overall story that she wanted to tell and then incorporates a supernatural element into it um, that I think she pulled off something really special. Yeah, and then I know we weren't really talking about 1916, but for people who didn't know, the Britannic is actually a pretty fascinating story too. Like I know, and this was my first um, hearing about it, so I was kind of drawn in by that um, um, yeah. as well. Uh, I agree with what you said totally, and that um, you know I, I, I'm going to assume there have been a ton of books written on the Titanic, uh, even in you know historical fiction type books not just you know biographies or, sure. or whatever you would call it um but this one this one definitely delivers a little something else and and here's what i'll say about the mystery of it right because we kind of talked about there's mysterious past and stuff i didn't see the end coming and i don't mean the titanic sinking i mean like the end of the <laughs> the, the kind of narrower story that becomes the focus of this book right it it, it kind of caught me off guard in in, in a good way yeah how everything so there's parts of it that I, I kind of figured out, but the overall like why of things was definitely something that surprised me and it was very satisfying um, for sure. I did. I did look on Wikipedia, by the way, for the, the Wikipedia articles for the RMS Titanic and the HMHS Britannic. And um, apparently um, they left out all the stuff about ghosts. So <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know. Mm. Look, Come on, just Wikipedia. like all good conspiracy theories, sometimes people aren't <laughs> believers and they just choose to pretend <laughs> it doesn't exist. But you and I and Alma, we know no better, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, we know. Um, that being said, there are some things that Rob and I are going to try to figure out on our own over in spoiler talk. Um, so here's the shtick. I wish we could put make a way like if you're listening on Patreon, you wouldn't have to listen to me begging for people to contribute to the Patreon like I'm about to do. Like you could <laughs> skip it because it's an ad. And like, you know, when you pay for a service, you don't have to see the ads anyway. Patreon.com slash book where Rob and I will spend, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes um, doing spoiler talk for this book. We do them for a lot of books, a lot more lately than we did early on. And you'd be helping support um, one of your favorite podcasts. Hopefully one of your so, favorites. Yeah. And yeah. Or, here's, or, even if we're not one of your favorites, that don't, don't let that keep you from donating. Here and here's how we keep this in for the Patreon people. If you think that we're a good enough podcast that you're giving us money on a monthly basis, tell your friends because maybe they will too. All right, we are back from a very interesting spoiler talk. It was definitely one of those where it solidified some of the things that I thought about the book and maybe made me change my mind about some other stuff. Uh, this time, not in a negative way. I know sometimes we come back and we're like, wait a minute. Um, mm -hmm. This time it was more like, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm going to kick off our wrap-ups if that's okay with you. Do it, please. Um, I like Gothic Horror. I like it in movies. I tend to like it in books um, most of the time. And I think that that's what uh, Al Makatsu delivered. It was a really good um, gothic horror story she managed to make it um feel more familiar and relatable much like the hunger by placing it um inside a, an actual story that we're all somewhat familiar with right so you know about the titanic right at the end leonardo dicaprio on that raft there's plenty of room for both of them right but he <laughs> winds up drowning like that's yeah so uh we don't cover that in this book but there are the lives of other people covered and and even outside of the the story proper, um, you know, there are some looks at um, the class system, right? So what the first class people get, what the third class people get. Um, and it feels like it's a well-researched um, period piece. Now let's talk about the supernatural elements. It is not bludgeoning with supernatural elements, which is also nice. The story unfolds in a way um, that I didn't see coming. I didn't. I wasn't able to predict the end um, at all. Uh, the characters, as I mentioned before, I'm super impressed with the fact that most of those characters thought they were the main character of the story, and I think that that played out super well um, in the book. I don't know what 1916 was like. I get the feeling that I, we might have gotten a, a good taste of. 1912 and 1916 in this book. I'm um, looking through my notes for the individual scores. Um, I scored it uh, very high in characters, um, plot, 
and personal score and then pretty high in, in everything else, right? So tone, pace, narrative, language, and audience. Um, this is great, I think, for anybody who doesn't hate period pieces. I know there are people out there that are not big fans of period pieces. Um, I, I happen to not mind them um, as long as they're written well. Uh, other than that, I have no real warnings for anybody. I don't think it's overly graphic. Um, so I don't think that you know people should shy away from this type of horror book. I think that it's written in a clean fashion that tells a, a good story. My final score averaged out 8.38 out of 10. I'm just going to start mine by saying um, when we went into spoiler talk, my rating was, I think, 8.1 something. And coming out of spoiler talk... I beefed a couple of things up, and now my my final score is eight point three eight, just like Livius. So um, he talked to me in, or maybe we just kind of collectively got excited enough about the story and spoiler talk that I did bump up my scores just a little bit. Um, the strengths of this book are really solid fucking historical fiction uh, foundation for a book that has supernatural elements, but. As we talked about in spoiler talk a little bit, sometimes the stuff that people were getting wigged out were supernatural, maybe didn't end up being supernatural. And that paid off the whole, like, you know, ambiguity of like, is something supernatural going on? Obviously, there was a supernatural element, but it, she, like Livia said, didn't beat you over the head with it. Sometimes the stuff was just a mundane explanation. And that kind of, in a way, I think lent some authenticity to the supernatural parts of it because it wasn't just like, well, everything's supernatural. It was like, yeah, sometimes people are just freaking out about shit. They don't need to be freaking out about. So much respect for that. Um, beyond that great characters. I think the plot was well-structured paced. Well, I, I can't really find much of an argument about anything. Even I think pace was the one that I um, dinged the most. And it, the only thing that was kind of strange was like, there are things that happen outside of the Titanic and Britannic journeys that I would have wanted to like, maybe know more about, but because of the way that the story was structured, it would have happened during the climax of the story, drawn out the climax and basically like ruined like the, 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 the structure of the end of the book. So the fact that it's not in there, is only in service of making it a readable and enjoyable book. Um, so the only place I wanted the pace to go a little slower was like the absolute worst place to make the pace go slower. Um, so that's kind of on me a little bit. All of that is to say we liked the hunger. I think that we, we stepped it up with our appreciation of the deep a little bit more. And um, man, if she just wants to keep coming out with, two word titles that are the whatever I'm going to keep reading them because this was just, it was, it was a fascinating, entertaining read, very enjoyable. And it's, I think the highest rating that we've given so far uh, this year. So 8.38, our overall score. Yeah. 8.375. And I think the difference there is just because the number of decibels in the, in the cells is different. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's an awesome book. I'm telling you, the next one is The Skies, Amelia Earhart. I'm putting money down on this right now. Yeah, I'll read that. I'm going to read The Skies. There you go. Um, yeah, good, good stuff. Now that the review's over, I just want to point out before we kind of ramble on about like whatever we happen to, to finish this episode off with, the very next episode, which is publishing the same day, is our interview with Al Makatsu. So once you're done listening to this episode, go right into that interview where maybe we get some of our questions answered or hear some more of like the history of the book and stuff like that. So definitely check that out. Rob, checking in on your water bottle. Yeah. This is, this is, we don't have the weird uh, baby next door anymore to oh. check in on. We, so for the next <laughs> couple of weeks, we'll be checking in on Rob's progress. Have you met your water goal for the, the days uh, since we last spoke about this? Yes, I've hit my goal every time. The problem I'm noticing is that so Monday and today, we're recording on a Wednesday, um, both days I forgot my water bottle at home uh, when I went to work. So <laughs> I had like a good portion of my day on Monday where I didn't do any drinking of water and I had to really nail like the last like eight hours of the day just pounding water. But I hit my goal every day. Today, uh, I actually came home. I had to run some errands on my lunch break, so I came home and picked up my water bottle. I'm about 79% into my goal right now, so I'll definitely... There's three more hours in the day, so easy, easy to, to hit my goal. 
So I keep thinking of ways to make a smart water bottle smarter. <laughs> and one of those ways would be if you try to leave the house without it, that you get a notification on your app. Um, yeah, that um, I'm sure there's, there's a way I can make that. So I, I'm all I'm I'm all in on Apple, and so there is a program called or a, an app called Shortcuts mm -hmm. that like basically lets you program automations. Oh. Right. So if Bluetooth disconnects from this device, notify me right. or something yeah. would be the yeah yeah. So I could probably I might have to make that happen so I don't make any mistakes. I have I have thought about going back to carrying a backpack with me when I go to work and back. Um, just so I've got like my laptop with me and stuff, but, um, I haven't made it. So it's on my mind. Cause like forgetting twice in one week is a little embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. And really what I don't want is for you to get home under pressure and drown yourself drinking all that water. <laughs> I, know. I don't want the bad the bassia, the, the sea witch to get you. Right. Really Cause then I'm going to have to f Maybe so uh, can... whoa, whoa, whoa. yeah, no, nope. <laughs> You may have to take that. That, that seems <laughs> to be very deep in a spoiler territory. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'll have to. Maybe I'll just beep it out. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't have much. I, we just did this three nights ago. Like, this is the, the, <laughs> the, the tightest recording window I, we've had in probably years. And then we're back tomorrow night recording again. Yeah. So um, it'll uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot else. To, to, do you have anything else to talk about? No. And honestly, here's what I'm going to say to the listeners. We're ending this episode now. It's probably going to be you know, a normal length episode, but there's going to be a minute or two of, of extra conversation that I happen to record um, before, we, <laughs> before we said welcome to book that's going to be kind of entertaining. So it's not quite done yet. All right. Our next review. So... You already know what the next episode is, but our next re review. So coming up one week from today, That Left Turn at Albuquerque by Scott Phillips. Um, what's the book we reviewed by Scott Phillips a few rake. years ago? The Rake. And uh, we really like The Rake, so I'm hoping we really like That Left Turn at Albuquerque. Um, sadly, we were not able to make it to the book release party um, for this. Uh, timing and stuff. Um, didn't work out. I'm kind of bummed because I was kind of thinking, oh, that might be fun to go down to uh, to the Meshuggah Cafe once again. Um, not in the cards this time. Maybe next time Scott Phillips has a book out, we'll make it down there. I would love to. Yeah, um, all of the all the deep the deep really sunk our trip to uh, to St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, 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 we did. <laughs> so uh, that's it, I guess, for this episode. Like Rob said, stay tuned for God knows what he's putting on here. Uh, but until next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. Yeah, but you ever have banana pudding? Oh, my God. Yeah, banana pudding's all right. The best yeah, they need to wafers. put banana. They need to make a banana cream M&M. Like they've been <laughs> doing all these weird M&Ms. <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny. Why an M and M specifically? I've been going through M and M's like because they keep releasing new ones. So currently, <laughs> like my favorite is like the caramel M and M's. Oh, but I had one that was like weird. It was like chocolate and um, like cayenne pepper or something. Like they've been coming out with some pretty weird M and M's. It just occurred to me when you said banana pudding that that would be good inside. <laughs> that belongs a... in an M and M. Yeah. Fuck, hold on. I got a fucking email M&M. <laughs> They're doing the same thing with Oreos. Is that Mars? Like birth, yeah. Birthday Dude, have cake you had... Oreos and shit? Well, the birthday cake Oreos are fucking amazing, but the, the newest Oreo on the market is the most stuff. Oh, God. I... So there was a double stuff, and then there was one called, I think, More Stuff. And this one's called The Most Stuff, and I think it's the cream from four Oreos stacked <laughs> on top of one another. It's just a pile of cream. There's not even cookie involved anymore. Well, they're still cookie. I just don't know why they don't put that shit in a jar. <sighs> why they don't just sell the cream. Cooler heads prevailed, I think, in the conversation. They're like, wait, that's insanity. Yeah. I mean, they don't need an extra $10 million in sales. <laughs> Dude, they did that. That shit would sell out instantly. Oreo stuff sell out. in a jar? Yeah. Yeah. It would sell out like, they're, like it was fucking canned goods in fucking <laughs> Los Angeles. Oh... Uh. They're like, is the coronavirus hitting this store? No, we just Oreo released stuff in jars. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, that's good to know. I, I, well, I don't have a sweet tooth, so like, um, 
yeah it take it takes a lot the thing the, about oreos that i think i like is that it's got less of like it's more of a not bitter but like mm-hmm. the edge the edge is taken off the sweetness yeah so i don't know all right this is a great welcome to candied yep yep stuffed it could be <laughs> stuffed well that's either going to be our gay porn <laughs> podcast or our oreo dedicated podcast yeah <laughs>